Hoje eu estou com o Tiago, assim, que está a nossa você, o seu grupo, na Droga Mundi, que nos nasce com o Tiago Santos Foro, e a segunda ideia, a Joia de Ana, a Joia de Foro, com o seu grupo de poder, o desenvolvimento de poder, com o seu grupo 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 de poder, Ала, чудесно, коли це мене. І він має питання досвід до цілування мистецтва в юнеті. Тобто, він не тільки коли це не монтував особистість, він приймає участь у вату на війнали як стикер, яка не йде, то ще відбувається на артемінгу. У Анна є власний простір, Ви відставляє свою колекцію та працює з художниками. Тобто, власне, на Голера посвідувалася з людиною, яка має досвід колекціювання вже інших власних років, і яка повністю розуміє, які тенденції і тренди відбуваються зараз у світі. І от якраз тема лекції Малена в його презентації – це практики колекціювання мистецтва нових медіа. Але з нами вже на зв'язку, і я продовжу на англійську мову. Hi, Alan. Hi. Hello. Yes. So, Hello, Natalia. Uh, yes, I already introduced you to our guests. And uh, so you're welcome to start. Uh, you talk about the collecting new media, the trends with the uh, new media art and your opinion as a collector about what's going on. And of course, your experience is also very valuable for us and for our collectors in Ukraine. So you're welcome to talk, to give your presentation. And after that, we will have questions uh, based on the, what you will tell us. Thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, uh, but a sadness not to be there in person, unfortunately, but we still have difficulties traveling. Uh, thank you very much, Natalia, for the invitation and the honor uh, to speak to this, um, this audience uh, in Kiev. So, um, of course, there's a lot of talks and writing in uh, a little bit everywhere about new media and digital arts uh, right now. But I think it's extremely important, particularly to an audience, uh, of, uh, of starting collectors or young collectors, it's very important to, to put um, a strong grounds and foundation to some very important notions. Because in fact, digital art, uh, new media, it's still about art. And to be able to position oneself, and understand why this new art is new, uh, we must go back to a series of notions. So, first of all, and if, if we want to start the presentation, I don't know, because I don't see the images myself. Can you show the first slide? Yes. Just one second. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. First slide, please. Here we start. Next. Thank you. So the, the first question that I believe very important to ask oneself um, almost every day, and I still I'm asking myself this question every day, and particularly when you are touching digital art, is what is art? And I'd like to go through this process by, by taking some examples, not to speak, to speak theoretically. On the left side, you have an artist called Domingo Zapata. He's uh, very funky, very noisy, um, but he's selling this kind of works between 50 and $100,000. Uh, you see it's having the kind of visual effect that everybody wants to have, a bit of superhero reference to the United States, pop art, a bit of street art, and it's got all the ingredients to make you comfortable um, and to, to, to be um, considered uh, saleable. But in my opinion, this is no art. The guy on the right side of your screen is called Thomas Kincaid. And to my big surprise, he's the biggest um, seller of, um, of art in the United States. 
He's been selling millions of those images uh, for tens of millions of dollars. And as you see, uh, it's looking more like a Disneyland um, uh, element. He's doing a lot of posters and different elements and forms. Um, um, but again, is this art? No, it's no art for me. You want to go to the next slide? Then the other kind of art that you hear a lot about um, uh, everywhere is the, that kind of experiential art, the, the art that you are experimenting. On the left side, you've got uh, Kusama, the infinity room. People are used to do uh, like one hour of a uh, queue at the minimum, just to, to stay within this space for 30 seconds and mostly not even enjoying the, the view, but mostly taking um, self, selfies to, to post on Instagram. Uh, the same on the right, it's also something that is, uh, I've been around the world everywhere and people, tens of thousands of people wanted to see it. It's called the rain room. When you enter, uh, you, you're falling under the water, but then suddenly uh, the, the water above you is controlled by, by computer and you never wet uh, through going, even with you going through the rain. So again, is this art? No, it is no art in my opinion. Next slide. Another category of art that you're going to talk about is, of course, uh, what you see here. Andy Warhol, uh, Dollar Sign, um, uh, Fontana on the right side, uh, depending on, on the number of, of, sl of sl slash that you have in the, in the canvas, it's going to be worth more. Everybody knows that uh, those two works are worth millions of dollars, but nobody's looking at what their meaning is anymore. They're just looking at, at it as an investment in many ways. Uh, and again, is this art? Not in my opinion. So you will tell me, okay, thank you, but you've been um, kind of um, considering that everything that I considered art to be no art, Mr. Serve. So what is art in your opinion? And then let's go to the next figure, to the next slide. I took here a quote that I found very interesting from um, a, a couple of... Um, collectors from Berlin, they are very famous in Berlin, uh, and they're called the Boros, and um, they, uh, did, they did that quote, very important quote, which is explaining uh, the process of uh, what art is, and I will read it slowly. A lot of times, when we first see work by an artist we don't know, we are irritated. We think we dislike it, but then we ask ourselves why we feel like this. We try to find out why is it that makes us uncomfortable. And, and that's the most important part of the process. The more we go into this, the more we start to like it. This is the process of art. The art, you know, art is about being brought outside of your comfort zone, outside of the thing that you, you think you like to bring you to another dimension. Um, and the, the rest of the quote is, um, is interesting as well because it's opening up to the fact that art is about other people. For me, being old is when you are no longer interested in other people. But if you are still collecting, that means that you are still interested in the opinions of others and you still want to learn. So this is what art is about. Um, and if I want, if we've seen everything, all the art we, we considered before, none of them was really questioning yourself, this make, making you uncomfortable, in, uh, getting you in other dimensions. So if we go back in the, in the culture, and I think it's very important again to have those bases before talking about the, what the specificity of, of digital arts and the art uh, online, um, we need to go back to uh, part of our culture. We can go to the next slide, please. The allegory of the cave by Plato is something, it, it's a myth which has been written almost 3,000 years ago. And hear me well, 3,000 years ago. Um, and it's, of course, very important in the Western culture, but I think it's very um, understandable um, also in other cultures, like the Slavic, the Slavic culture as well. So the... are ...born there, the only thing we see in front of us are shadows, shadows of, uh, of objects. 
because the only thing we ever saw are shadows, we think it is reality. And this is what's happening in our life. It's many of the things that we think, whether it's about happiness, reality, love, uh, politics, um, we, we think that we know what it is. It can, it can be consumption, it can be money, it can be um, uh, social recognition, and so on. What he's saying is that what every human should do is to try to get out of the chain, start looking at the light as it is, and if possible, exit the cave to eventually see the reality as it is. And this is what art can help you to do, is to, to kind of open yourself to different form of realities that will bring you closer to the reality. And then the, the end of the myth is interesting, is that if you are really a good person, then you will go back in And this is called the philosopher. So in my opinion, can we go back for one second? Back? Yes. So my, in my opinion, this is what art is about. Art is about um, bringing you to new, new realities. And it's very, very important to understand that notion that art is not about what is making you comfortable, that you find pretty or beautiful. It's about what it's opening up your mind. I'll give you an example of a work that we have in the collection. And we can go to the next slide. This is a work by a Chinese artist. It's called Li, Liu Chuang. Um, it's very important, the process. So what you see here is not an image. It's actually uh, pieces. Uh, they are objects that are flat on the ground. They are put on the ground. And they are clothes. They are newspapers. They are phones. They are keys. The, what the artist is, is doing is, is um, meeting people in the street in a city in China, which is very important for, for the industry. There's a lot of, um, it's a huge city of tens of millions of people. And he's asking the people that he meets in the streets, can you please sell me everything that you have on you? All the clothes, your, your underwear, your socks, your passports, your keys, your phone, absolutely everything. As you can imagine, it is not easy to achieve this. And eventually, so he sells them um, and he gives them a sweatshirt and they just go away and they leave everything they own. Obviously, what you have here is a portrait of someone in 2009 in that city of Guangzhou in China. So, of course, uh, 100 years ago, when we're doing portraits, portraits of people working, people in the street, or taking photography later on. So this is another way of making that portrait. And what was very interesting to me is that when I have Chinese people visiting, of course, they can read the Chinese that I cannot read. And they said to me, oh, it's very probably a migrant, so someone that is coming from the countryside to come to the city to, to work because there are different um, education diploma, but there's also advertising for jobs. Um, and so what I have here is a portrait of a, of a Chinese migrant in 2009 in Guangzhou. So of course, it's not the usual form. Some people can discuss whether it's pretty or beautiful or not. But at the end of the day, it is a way of, of asking you question and asking myself question of what is a portrait? What is the reality? Who are those people and how can we approach them? Because most often, as, as you know, everything we own is telling us about who we are, even sometimes more than our face and our image. So this is a work of art that I'm very happy to own in the collection. So it's, we can go to the next slide. So then you say, OK, but it's very strange because this, you know, in a way, I could also do it myself. Uh, so what makes the difference and what makes the value of this work of art? About the value of art, it's very important to understand this because when you own, let's say a car, a car has got the advantage that it can bring you from point A to point B with your family, bring them to school. If you have uh, um, a refrigerator, uh, it's keeping the food um, uh, healthy for a few days when it's at home. So it's got a function. It's, it, it brings um, uh, a utility. What the art has a characteristic is that the art has got no use. 
it's, it's not useful. It's no function at all. So how can you value something which has no function? And it, here it's very important to use that quote uh, from 1966 by Leo Castelli, who is a very legendary dealer from New York. And he said, you say, why should you, um, what should you ever want to pay? Um, I, will, I will read it here. Why should anyone want to buy a Cezanne for $800,000? What's a little Cezanne house in the middle of a landscape? You know, everybody can do it. Why should it have value? And that's a very important point. It's because it's a myth. It's, it's just, it's like, it's like a Malevich or any other artist. It, it creates a myth around um, this artist. Because it's a myth, we, we make myth about politics. We make myth about everything. I have to deal with myth from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. And it becomes harder and harder. We, we, because we live in an age of rapid obsolescence. My responsibility is the myth making of myth material, which if handled properly and imaginatively is the job of a, of a dealer. And I have to go at it completely. One just can't prudently build a myth. And that's a very important notion because it's very important to understand that the industry of art is about building myth. It's about trying to make you believe that something is of value. And you, you, have, you need to be able not to believe everything because in some way, you know, a T-shirt or, or a vacuum cleaner or television you're buying in a shop, it's got a certain value for you. Uh, and it's also this competition for it. So, you know, it's very important to get that notion um, of, um, of art. So we finish with this introduction. Uh, thank you for your patience. And we're going to get to digital art now. Next slide, please. Because... When we are talking about digital art, it's nothing else than a painting, except that it's mostly represented by a digital file. Like a digital file that it could be a, a movie that you made of your family during the holidays, or some pictures that you took of the birthday of your daughter, of different elements, um, or a movie that you are downloading from internet. So digital art is nothing else than a digital file. And this is very important to understand because we're going to come back to that notion and understanding about it. Because there are, there are, there are two elements linked to that digital file. First of all, there is a copyright which is a, a, attached to it. It's very important. And this copyright exists in a painting and a sculpture as well as a movie or video or, or a, a software. So as you know, this notion of copyright is extremely important because when you buy even a painting, you, you have some right, which is the one of enjoying the work at your home, which is very normal, but there are rights that you don't have. For example, you can take a picture of it for your personal use, but you could not publish this picture of a work of art that you own in, in, a, public, um, in a publication. So let's say that I, I am owning a work of art. I'm owning the work of the, Japan, that the Chinese artist we saw earlier. I think, OK, I can take a picture. It's mine. No, it's not yours. The copyright of the image still belongs to the artist forever if there has not been a transfer of those, of those rights. So I'm sorry to get a little bit technical here, but this is the key of a lot of, of discussions in, um, in uh, digital art and new media arts. So rather, um, rather than thinking that owning a work of art that is written here, it might be best to think of copyright as a bundle of right. What is the first right? It's the right to reproduce. I, I, I explained this, taking a picture and publishing this picture is not allowed. You need to ask permission, and, and they're still happening very often that uh, the artist um, will sue you if you are publishing um, uh, an image without his permission. The same if you have a digital file. Um, you are not supposed to reproduce it, may, may, meaning that if you make a copy of it, because of course digital files are easy to copy, you do, you do, you do a cut and paste, everybody can do a cut and paste. But you don't have that right to do that, and certainly not to share that right to um, a platform. 
if you don't have the permission of the artist, you cannot share the digital file online. So um, the right to make derivative works. Let's say that you, you buy a photograph. You cannot, for example, put that photograph, even if it belongs to you, you cannot do a t-shirt of it and, and start selling that t-shirt. You don't have that right. You cannot distribute the copies of the work. This is what I described earlier, meaning that you own the work, uh, but you cannot post it on Instagram. Even if you paid it, you don't have that right. It's very important to understand. Um, you have the right um, to perform it publicly. So that's um, normally it's attached to the fact that you own the, the, the right. But for example, um, it could be that the artist is unhappy with uh, the condition of, into which you're going to show it. And I, I'll give you an example uh, that was um, uh, important a few years ago. There was a, a major collector of Anselm Kiefer, a very important uh, German artist. Um, he, he assembled a group of 50 major works of Anselm Kiefer, and he wanted to do an exhibition in China. Uh, but without asking the artist, without considering the artist in any way. So he was, um, uh, he was doing a show in different museums and getting uh, paid. People would have to pay to enter the show. So what um, happened there is that the artist was not happy and the artist was not giving permission to show the works publicly. Um, so as you understand, this, this is a very important right as, as well. And so display the work publicly, I said all this. Um, so it's very important that this copyright exists for a photography which is 100 years old. Of course, as you know, the copyright is attached to, to someone and, and it's, um, it's staying with this someone for 70 years after their death. So it's very important to understand. So when I say 100 years, of course, it could be in the public domain. But let's say that you buy a photography today of a, of a Ukrainian photographer. Um, you don't have the right to do whatever you want, whether it's photography, whether it's a sculpture, whether it's a painting as well. And of course, whether it's a, a new media. So it's very important to, to, to take that into consideration. And I'd like to go to the next uh, slides. Um, there was a case uh, recently, um, because we're now reaching the NFT here about. And the problem is that this kind of product, it's a little bit like you were considering that you were developing a new car or you're developing a new uh, medicine, but you, you're not having the proper uh, authorization to do that. You're not following the rules. You're not respecting um, some elements of, um, of copyright that are linked to different things because you're copying, let's say, you're copying a Porsche too much or you're copying a Tesla too much. So uh, what happened with the um, uh, NFT is that people started posting all those things, but they didn't think clearly enough about the different elements of it. And I, I give you here an example of someone that wanted at one point to take the image of a, of a Basquiat and do an NFT, taking a picture, posting it, uh, creating a digital file, and then selling the digital file as an NFT. And so it's, it's quite well described here. An NFT is a, is a unique data file that is encrypted, okay? So what is an NFT? An NFT is a link, is a protected link to a file. So it's very simple to understand. Let's say that you have a file on your computer, a file of the photos of your holidays, for example. There's a unique link to that file. Nobody else can access that file but you. But it's not solving two problems that are very important. First of all, does the file belong to the people selling it? Does he have the right to sell this? And this is the case in the Basque here that is described here. The second case is try to think about what's happening of your family holidays 15 years ago, one five years ago. You know that sometimes you go to your computer and you try to open a file and you cannot open it anymore because the software has transformed and has evolved and you cannot open it anymore. So it's very important to understand that in a digital file, there's also an element of technological obsolescence, meaning that you cannot always 
use the same software, use the same hardware. I mean, it's very well known that if you, were, if you open a Word document that you wrote a letter 20 years ago, if you try to open it in Word again, it will be very difficult. And that's the, that's the kind of element that is not properly understood right now in, uh, in the new media art. And if you get involved into me new media arts, it's very important that you think about those elements. And me as a collector, uh, I'm very careful with this, which means what, for example? For example, I have a standard contract that I am using with artists, which when I'm using, I'm buying digital uh, files from them, we are describing what are the rights that I have. And the kind of right that I'm requiring, for example, is to say, Okay, I have the right to show those works in a museum, which in a non-commercial environment, without asking you permission. Okay, that's one right that I have. Um, another right that I have is, of course, I'm getting a, a file. I'm getting a, a, like a USB key. Or I'm, I'm using a whatever file. What I want is not to be attached to that file. I want to be able to ask the artist, please, if there is a technological obsolescence, me or my successors, my children, can come back to you and ask for you a new version of that file, updated with a new technology. That's another uh, things that I'm um, requiring from this. But so you see that, that, that um, little page about um, the Basquiat, uh, it's, it's drawing some very important uh, element. And I asked Natalia to put uh, this PDF uh, available for you, so I will not read it in details. Um, but it's very important that um, you read this uh, very carefully. Um, and understand that you cannot do anything. And we get to the next file, the next slide, sorry. Yeah. Those are examples of different lawsuits that have appeared in the last few years about the copyrights and any, in any form of media. And this is why I, I use different form of media. Uh, to, to say this. One was a Romanian politician. He was suing the Brancusi. Why was he suing the Brancusi, the Brancusi family? It's because in his city, there was a public sculpture of Brancusi, as you know, the very major uh, Romanian sculptor. But the city is not allowed to take pictures of those Brancusi and post them on the website of the city. This is not allowed. So of course it seems illogical to the, to the mayor of the city. And he said, I want to get away with this. So I want to sue the family that they cannot forbid me to use that copyright. Another, um, another case is a street art uh, artist, which is asking a very important question because if you are drawing on the wall, you know, you're doing a, a graffiti on the wall. Who's it belonging to? And what happens is sometimes um, the street artist, the street art is used as a background for an advertising, for photography, for example. So it's appearing by accident in a background. And this is what happened uh, against the Vatican. So this artist is suing the Pope um, because he's, um, he's saying that the art was used without permission. So those copyrights, it's no... It's, no, it's no, not a joke. It is a very important element. The technological obsoles obsolescence is very important as well. So as a summary, uh, before getting to the questions, I'd like to bring to your attention those very important notions. First of all, you need to think what is art, because not everything is art. Not everything which is described by art, written by art, and not even because someone is buying it for $1 million, doesn't mean that is art. So you need to take your own definition, which must be a critical um, definition of what art is. And when you get to that point, you must understand that the, the possession, the ownership, like me as a collecting, the collecting of any work of art implies um, some elements of rights. And they are su summarized um, under the term copyrights. And very important to understand that. In the case of digital art, there's one additional element, which is the technological obsolescence, because the digital file to which you have rights will not always be read um, in any software. So sometimes you can still own 
a, a digital file, which is maybe five years old or 10 years old, is the same way as you would try to use a, an iPhone from five years ago. You know, there are many things that it will not be able to do at all. So it's very important to take those elements into account. And that's some, of course, I, we may be going to go in more details, uh, but it is, those are notions that when you start collecting or considering collecting digital art that you must keep in mind very carefully. Natalia? Yes. Up to you. Yes. Thank you very if much. I did, if I didn't lead you to fall asleep, I'm sorry for those technical elements. No, everything uh, was okay. I think everybody uh, heard uh, all, uh, all your information. Actually, I have some questions from myself, and then I will give uh, our guests the uh, possibility to ask uh, questions as well. So actually, uh, we are moving, uh, uh, I guess, gradually or faster to a digital world. If, uh, say, five years ago, it was like a, a kind of... Uh, you know, futuristic ideas or some, uh, it's, uh, it, it was seeming that it's not nearby, it's not in our life. Right now, it looks like it's already part of our life. And uh, we as uh, galleries or uh, as uh, art dealers actually uh, also have a lot of questions because uh, what actually can I sell or what uh, my clients will buy? Because if they see a digital uh, or a video file, um, so uh, how our clients or collectors can use them. And this is what, uh, uh, what you were talking about, that it's very important to fix it in the agreements and understand how you can use it. But in case with NFT, when we have a lot of artists asking how they can uh, try to do an NFT based on the art. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, platforms allowing uh, artists to do NFT, but in this case, we don't understand that artists either, how they can uh, actually write, which kind of rights they give with NFT. Because, okay, they create a digital uh, picture, uh, like a record to the file, but does this allow client to print it out or uh, to make uh, you know, a physical copy of this picture and put it on the wall? Uh, can the client sell this kind of picture or he owns only a digital file? And we have plenty of questions about this. So what do you think, how this will develop in the future? I mean, uh, um, and what would you advise actually artists as well if they want to try doing NFT? How they need to specify? Uh, first of all, first of all, I there's one word which I hate is just after COVID is NFT. NFT, <laughs> NFT is just a fashion. It's a stupidity of a fashion that has been brought up because people had too much time, too much money, and too much kind of element of populism. You know, it's, it's not smarter than listening to the propaganda of um, Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin. It's the same thing, you know. Uh, it's it's a lot of a lot of noise, a lot of noise, but um, it's not um, it's no content. So first of all, it's very important to understand that NFT is digital art. Digital art exists for twenty years. I am collecting digital art for twenty years. I'm collecting files, websites for twenty years. So there's nothing new. What is important is to make the difference between any kind of file, any kind of blah, 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 I'm a robot, blah, 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 or any stupid thing on TikTok, okay, to confuse it with art. And that's why I'm sending you to the, to the first part of my presentation is first of all, it must be art to be sold as art. It's and not because you put the brand, it's not because you have a Gucci uh, sticker that is the Gucci bag, okay? You know this. So 
uh, it's very important to, to understand that, that first element. The thing that has changed since I've started collecting 20 years ago is the blockchain. So what I prefer to talk is about digital art and blockchain, which is, in one word, now people are using NFT. Because NFT is nothing else than blockchains directing you to a work of art, a digital file, which is supposed to be a work of art. Okay. And again, I repeat, not every digital file is art. So, and a lot, I would say even 99% of what is called NFT art is nothing else than a meme. You know, it's all the meme that are circulating on, on, on uh, Instagram or Twitter or in social media for 20 years. And they are, you know, it's the same with, uh, I don't know, uh, someone is stumbling, falling off the, the red carpet in Cannes or something. And uh, you do a meme or whatever, there is a, a, a witch coming out. And people find that very funny. Okay, funny. But it, it lasts only one second because you laugh once. Does it mean that it's a work of art? No. Uh, it's not a work of art, in my opinion. So um, it's not, you know, what NFT art is in the worst expression of it. It is mem art. It is selling mem as if they were art. And of course, sometimes we say, wow, this is a super mem. It's super funny. Like, I don't know, this, this mem, when you see the, the girlfriend and the boyfriend look, walking in the street and the boyfriend turns around and look at the girl going in the other direction. And it has been used by any kind of companies to, and to express different things, okay? But this is still no art, in my opinion, um, in terms of what is it making you think? Of course, you know, everybody has seen this same. So, so NFT is, is a kind of a cover-up for all kind of speculation, um, which is, in fact when underlying it is something important, which is digital art, which is a very important medium, and blockchain, which is one way of, of um, certifying your ownership of that file. But NFT is still not solving the problem of technological obsolescence, meaning that if you post a digital art somewhere, and for example, you don't have a contract with the artist, that it will maintain the, the work of art, the digital file, for a very long period, then it will never be useful as a work of art. And you remember the words of Leo Castelli about the myth making, is that the myth will not be a myth because you will have a file which will show a new computer and you will click on it like crazy and it will never open. So where's the myth? <laughs> so before being excited, like people are excited by any kind of propaganda, nationalized propaganda or, or football team or movie or, or, or fashion, uh, uh, fashion um, elements, you know, you need to think about those elements first. And it's better to cut them into their different components than to put them all together under the terms NFT. So please never speak to me about, again about NFTs. Okay. So uh, actually, I was uh, talking about NFT not as an art, but as technology making you know possibility for artists to you know to come even to digital world. Because if they do a record, say of their picture or uh, of their painting, they actually duplicate their art to some to some point. They have a physical art and they have uh, a picture, which they also say that this is a copy or another. Uh, type of art. So uh, I think NFT could be art if artists consider so. You know, so in this case, we're still maybe it's a speculation, but I think it's still going on. You know, uh, and in here I have another question. Uh, today we will have a round table, and uh, we have some institution and collectors who actually will be discussing also digital art and NFT. And one of the institution we have, they put uh, the collection on NFT. Actually, they made a, a, an uh, they launched a minted NFT uh, for the collection, and in here uh, we will discuss. Uh, what will be the actual the rights? Does the institution have a right to do NFT for the art they own? Because either they have such rights actually to put on the internet and uh, make an NFT, it's like a publication, 
But on the other hand, they actually making a record on blockchain. They look like uh, authors. They look like uh, the original producers of this art, you know? And this is also some uh, issue which I think will sooner or later arise for the collectors and for uh, making digital, you know, platform for their collections. But again, um, I talked about all this already because you can create an NFT if you have the right to that work of art. So if your institution is owning works from an artist who died more than 70 years ago, the art is free of right. And you are free like the Uffizi uh, in the museum in Italy uh, did. You can do... Um, you can do an NFT from a Bernini uh, work of art. The problem is who will be stupid enough to pay $170,000 for what is nothing else than a picture that you could take yourself in the museum and bring home? Because it's worth nothing more. It's got no rights. It's got no special quality. Because the only th thing that you're selling as an NFT, as you say, minting, which because it, it, it makes people feel important because they invent new words. Oh, I'm minting. So, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, what it is, is just selling a photograph from um, this work of art, putting it on internet and saying to a stupid guy, okay, man, you paid 170000 for this and you have this picture for you. But... Anybody can take the same picture than you. So my big thing is who is stupid enough to spend money on it. And all I'm saying is to those museums and those institutions, as long as there are enough stupid people to pay you money for it, mint them as much as you, as you can to, in order to preserve your collection, to make education program in your museum, take the money from those stupid people. And I never mind to take the money of stupid people. <laughs> Okay, so now I would like uh, to ask for questions from our guests, please. У кого є запитання, будь ласка. Можете підійти якраз запитати? Hello, Alan. You will do the translation for me. Uh, I speak English, yeah. Yeah, I speak English. Uh, thank you for your lecture, it was wonderful. Uh, so my question is, can NFT file be deleted? And if yes, who can delete an NFT file? Thank you. We are becoming technicals in some way, and I, I must admit I'm not 100% an expert in, in, uh, on this in the question. My uh, idea would be to say, um, again, the best ways to try to decompose um, the question by saying, okay, there's an NFT. So you, um, the, the person asking the question, you own an NFT. What is, what is the NFT? The NFT is a digital file created by someone who's got the right to the image of what you own, that is putting it on, in, a, in, a, in a file somewhere, in a storage somewhere, and it's creating a link to allow you to access that file. So... It is, in some way, the artist doesn't have the right to delete that file anymore. Okay, so I would say it's not the artist. Is it, um, but what happened then if I do anything with the, with the file, meaning that I sell it again to 1,000 people, let's say, but it still does not allow the artist to delete the file, but the, the, the artist can sue you in court, like we've seen a different lawsuit that you've seen before. So it's still not destroying the, the file. Then you get to the question about destroying a work of art that belongs to you. And there, the, the law is different in different countries. For example, in the US, uh, there is a, a law called VARA law, V-A-R-A -A law, okay? Which is giving some specific right to the artist that does, do not always exist in every country in the world. So you must check it. But it is, for example, forbidden for me as an owner of anything. Let's say that even I own a painting. 
I own a painting by Natalia. And um, I decide I want to be buried with it and burn it with me in a crematorium. Okay? This is forbidden. So I cannot de destroy a work of art, even if it belongs to me, by an artist in the United States. So in the question that you were asking, no one in the United States would be allowed to, dis to delete that file, uh, that NFT. But again, it's a question of, of, of legal uh, elements. It depends on the contract you've signed with the artist, because of course the artist can give up that right. If the artist say, okay, I'm selling you this and you're free to de destroy it, but you put it in writing. So again, it goes back to the contract, which is the most important element. And this is unfortunately what is not discussed enough in digital art and NFT is that everything is in fact about contracts. Any further questions? I'm hoping I answered this question properly. Uh, hello, I have a question. So you've mentioned about uh, would the, would you go back to artists for updates because um, of uh, changes in software and hardware? But can we consider this scene the same as about old paintings which transferred from wood to canvas, for example, by restorers? Maybe we just will have the same restorers of future which will deal with that media art for you and for our children and grandchildren to watch them in a proper way. Thank you. You are perfectly right. And we, we get there to a very interesting question of the preservation. You know, preserving art is the most important role of a collector and a museum. You know, it's about this. It's about preserving a work of art for 50 years, 100 years, 500 years, 2000 years. So of course, it depends on whose responsibility it is. So of course, you're totally right. Um, uh, it is normal that there is a technological obsolescence, but it is very important to understand because sometimes I have collectors of digital art, they buy uh, a screen with a video file on, on, on their wall, okay? And the, fi the file is turning, okay? And suddenly after three years, it doesn't work anymore. And of course, it's the same as a painting, except that in the case of a painting, I mean, it will be a different kind of destruction, which could be humidity or too much light or whatever. It will be the same kind of technological obsolescence. So, of course, in that case, you need, um, because the, the only one who's got the master file is the artist. Because here it's not like a painting, because it's not that the artist can redo the painting. It's just that you can redo the file if you go back to the master file. But of course, you cannot expect that that's very important as well. You cannot expect that the artist will give you a kind of lifetime guarantee that the work will, will work. Because it, I have the case in some of the digital work that I'm owning. You know, sometimes they don't work. Does it mean that I can call the artist and say, hey man, come home and fix it? Because it doesn't work. No. It is my responsibility to discuss with him how to make it. And for example, the kind of rules that I apply when I buy digital art is to say the artist is responsible for the maintenance for five years. This is just an agreement. It could be two years, it could be three, five, 10. It depends what you negotiate with the artist. But I find that five years is something which is acceptable for both parties. So for five years, the artist is, in, is responsible to maintain the file. After five years, we will work together to still make it work. But if it costs the artist, because it happened to me that there was a work of art that was costing 4,000 euro, digital work of art, to transfer to the new systems, okay? So I, I, I knew from the beginning and I was happy to pay this. Not happy, of course, you're never happy to pay $3,000, but I was totally aware that like a painting, I. I can maintain it. And of course, it's a different kind of maintenance. You were talking about restorer of the paintings or the photography. It's a different type of maintenance. And you're right that the restorers are different because they're more developers than, than uh, restorers. But it's, it would be the same is how to do it. And 
what is very important is to say to the artist, and that's the most important thing that I'm discussing when acquiring the works. I must understand that the artist has got enough documentation so that I can, in the future, do the restoration of the work, even if the artist is not alive anymore. Because, of course, I must know where there is a file. And that's something which does not exist yet. It's a kind of a main, like, uh, let's call it um, a cloud, just for work of art, that would be preserving the work of art, the master files. And master files is a very important notion, because I go back a little bit in time, but it's the same with the movie industry. You know, in, in the Titanic movie, only the director has got the master file. There's one master file, which is the master file. And what the, what the director does, he gives the right to make a production of those master files, which will end up in a movie theater in Kiev. Okay? But it's coming from that master file. So it's very important that the, that the artist and the director preserve the master file. That's the responsibility of the artist. And so it's, it would be better to have a centralized, and it's the same for the movies. As you know, we are trying to restore movies from 100 years ago. And the problem is many of those movies are destroyed, and maybe 10% of those movies are still surviving. So it is the very important, the restoring is extremely important. Um, and, and it's a big responsibility from the institution and from the collectors. I'm hoping I answered the question. Thank you. We still have time. Any questions, please? One more question, please. I have also one, but I, I want to... Uh... Yes, please. Okay, I will be translating. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Да? Но мы знаем, что большинство э, платформ NFT, где можно их произвести или продать, э, эти маркетплейсы, э, они, э, это американские платформы. Да? И когда я захожу и регистрируюсь на эту платформу, я подписываю terms of use, да? и э, эти terms of use, они по американским законам. Ну, я имею право, когда я обладаю это NFT, я имею право ее уничтожить, Серьезно, сжечь, сжечь. Да. Да? Здесь у меня вопрос тогда, да? если по американским законам нельзя уничтожить художественное произведение, то по американским же законам на этих основных а, платформах, американских же, я легко могу сжечь работу, если я ею обладаю. Mm -hmm. So the question is, Alan, uh, the following. According to uh, American legislation, you just mentioned that uh, it is forbidden to uh, delete or to destroy the work. But if we take this, again, NFT platforms where you do this, um, you know, the digital record of the work, so according to the rules, uh, you can burn NFT. So you actually can destroy it and delete it. So how how this will then go on with this uh, United States rules? Okay, so I'm sorry we, we, we're a little bit technical, but it's very important. And that's what I would like to bring from this uh, debate is that it is not complicated if you understand those key notions of copyright. It's about the copyright. But it's also, when you, when you hear the, the word rights, it's also about you can give that right to someone else. You can give the right to someone to use your swimming pool in your garden. You can, use, you can give the right to someone to use your bike if you rent the, your bike or your, your car to someone else against payments. Okay? So it is all a question of, of rights. So every marketplace, let's, let's call a marketplace something like a bank. You know, a bank has got different rules. How do you deposit money? How do you take out money? What? Who can you transfer money to? Um, what can you do with the money? Can you buy drugs? Can you do whatever? I mean, and so on and so on and so on. So the marketplace has got different rules that are different and there's no general answer to your question. Uh, you must look at the contract. And I'm sorry to say that unfortunately in this time, 
when people are extremely lazy in reading, they don't want to read. Um, and that's why we have that, those things that every time we enter a website, we press OK, OK, OK. And we're giving many, many rights to the, to the website to, um, to, uh, to follow you and to observe you and to sell you to uh, some other people that sometimes you would not like to sell. And that's the big problem that we have online and digital. So um, the problem is that if you get seriously involved as a collector like me or as an artist, as, as a, a way of living, you must read those contracts. You must read the contract of the... Um, you must re read the contract about um, uh, the NFT, what, you, what rights you are giving, what is the contract of the platform, what is the contract that you have with your clients, which is the people you're selling to, or me as, a, as an acquirer of work of art, what is the right that the artist is giving me, or what is the minimum rights that I want to get from this artist, okay? So it's, um, um, and of course, the same with the VARA, uh, American rule. Um, as you know, for example, if we decide that I will buy a work from Natalia, the contract will identify that the contract is under the Ukrainian law, or the contract is under the London law, or the contract is under the New York law. What does it mean? Is that it is the general rules of that different country which, which, which is involved. So of course, if VARA does not exist in your part of the world, you don't have to worry about VARA if the contract that you're writing with whoever buys the works is done under Ukrainian law or German law or whatever kind of law. And depending on the platform, even if the marketplace is the different story, it depends what are the rules on the marketplace. If the marketplace allows it, every artist minting on that marketplace will give that permission. And so you can agree to everything. Um, even in my country, it's, it's possible that I give you the permission of killing me. Uh, because we have euthanasia, so I could give Natalia the right to inject me something which will end my life. So you can agree, you can agree to everything as long as it's allowed by law. So um, again, you need to look into your contract. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have uh, a bit, uh, we, still, uh, we still have some time and I use my right to ask you one question. It's not about only NFT. So we live in um, still in COVID time, right? So I don't know what are the restrictions in your country, but I guess they are still uh, very strict uh, um, as a collector of digital art of new media art. Do you feel that the trends in art market actually changing? People are more buying and um, of uh, digital art asset or they uh, turn to, you know, virtual world more. So uh, do you notice that actually we gradually go to the virtual world and also as a result, the digital, uh, the digital art is getting more recognition? like a uh, mass recognition. Okay. Um, first of all, what you have, you remember the, the Plato's cave? Yes. That I explained? Everything you're talking about, the world is becoming digital. We all becoming, oh, COVID does not allow us to go out anymore. You know, all this is shadows on your wall. It's all the bullshit that is going around the media everywhere. Every stupid people has got the same discussion around a beer or, uh, or some marijuana you're smoking or whatever you're doing, okay? So it's very simple. It's an illusion. So, of course, the um, COVID keeps you home. But I'm sorry, you cannot not go out of home. I mean, I'm, I'm currently in Madrid, and that's why I'm going to have to leave you because I've got a plane in one hour and 45 minutes. So... You know, I'm in Madrid. Uh, this week I've been in, uh, in Paris. And the week before I was in, um, in uh, uh, Amsterdam. And the week before in Berlin. And the week before in St. Petersburg. So don't tell me that it's not possible to travel anymore. Okay. In Ukraine, there's another problem. It's a question of passport. The different elements. So it's not true. But you can experience art in real. And what is very important during that period is that I'm so sad because I spoke to you about the stupid guy spending 170,000 on the photograph, okay? That everybody can take. 
But I'm also sad to the people that think that living on the digital world is life. And I say that about Instagram, Tinder, Netflix. I mean, those three are done to get as much money possible from you and making you as stupid as possible in return. That is what you get, okay? Because you suddenly don't sleep anymore because you don't have likes of the last picture you took of you. You're wondering, should I remake my nose? Because I'll shit, okay? Um, the Tinder is, you know, am I going to find a girlfriend? But the problem is never trust what I on Tinder because the picture, when you meet the person, you say, are you, are you serious? Is it you? Because I don't recognize you. Is it 25 years ago or something? Uh, or did you retouch how many times? Um, and the rest is the same. And the cryptocurrencies, you know, there's an article today in Bloomberg explaining how much billions, you hear me, billions of dollars have been stolen from stupid people using scam about cryptocurrencies. So the only thing I can tell you, again, going back as a conclusion to the cave, the only way to live happily is to develop your own brain. Okay? This is the only way, you know, you can live under any kind of totalitarian regime, as long as you are free in your heads, you are free. So it's about increasing your awareness. And this is what art can help you to do. So don't think about those broad notion of, oh, yeah, everybody digital. No, there are many people that say, I don't want digital anymore. You know, I know many, many collectors that, and I, I'm the, one of them, I never went on any online viewing room or VR, never. I'm one of them that would rather die than go on one of those marketplaces or NFT, so boring it is. And I find Netflix absolutely horrible because we know it's controlled by algorithm, which means that they're able to know at one point some people will leave that movie or that episode because, I don't know, the hero is dying or the girlfriend is getting too fat or has got a view from the back and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And they will change it the next time to give you exactly what you want to have. Okay, and life is about getting what you don't, what you cannot have. This is what the exciting thing in life is. So I'm going back to what sounds a very stupid philosophical discussion, but art is about philosophy, about making yourself more aware, aware of where you're living, aware of the manipulation around you, around, aware of you know, the culture that makes you hate the Muslim that hate, makes you hate the Russian, makes you hate the Ukrainian, makes you think that every Ukrainian woman is a whore, and so on and so on. You know, this is those stupidities that you must fight in many ways. And this is what art can bring you to do, and that's the only value. And whether you do it digitally, physically, whatever, it doesn't count, as long as it works. Am I helpful? Thank you, thank you. So, uh, last minutes together with Alan. He's uh, running to the airport. Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you, Dialan. That was really interesting. And actually, I would add that a lot of our collectors who are not collecting digital, when I ask them about this, uh, they say, you know, I'm so hungry for really real life and fulfilling of the painting that I doubt that I will you know, buy any digital. But again, I would not even part digital or offline art. I think if it's real art, it doesn't matter whether it's digital or it's offline, right? So I wish you would read. Exactly. Yeah, let's keep in touch. And Thank you. Thank you yes. for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you. And don't hesitate to share the PDF if anybody is interested. You can put it on your website. It's, it's free for you, free of rights. I'm thank giving you. you the rights. You allow. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.